Welcome to Foundstone Conversations, where we chat with industry leaders to give you real world insights on all things strategy. And today we're fortunate to be speaking with a person who in my personal opinion, is doing some, some pretty positive and groundbreaking things across the strategy landscape. He's opening up mindsets to give some different perspectives, or well, he has mine anyway. And he's really creating genuine communities from what I see on the topic across many parts of the world. Originally born and bred in Australia, but he joins us all the way from New York City, where he now is based. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, Mark Pollard. What's up? How are you, Andrew? I'm well, thank you, Mark. And thank you for joining us. I know it's a Wednesday evening around eight o'clock your time. So appreciate you, you very much making the time. I live for this. Why wouldn't I join you? I appreciate being invited. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Just to give our viewers a bit of context, uh, some of our, our viewers are probably more from the, the, the business strategy side of things. Uh, so, so Mark is strategy CEO of Mighty Jungle. He's the host of Sweathead, which is a podcast which has hundreds of thousands of, li of listeners. And I know you're running multiple events um, in terms of creating those genuine communities. And Mark's recently, or fairly recently, written uh, a book, Strategy Is Your Worlds. Is your, is your word, sorry, a strategist fight for meaning. And this is a book, it's, it's had quite an impact on me, Mark. I read it earlier this year, um, being based in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we've gone through a few lockdowns recently. And it's really, really had a really positive influence on myself and in giving me a lot of courage to dig a bit deeper on strategy. So, I wanted to thank you for that and um, really just wanted to open up, perhaps from your perspective, if you, if you give us a quick rundown on your career to date, perhaps even just starting in, in, in Australia and then to now where you're based in New York. Totally. I'll try to do this really, really quickly as well. And thank you for your kind words. I started in agencies around the age of 19. I was studying a double degree at UNSW and was making websites about rap music while also rapping. Uh, outside of all the study and ended up getting a, uh, an internship and then a part-time job in a digital agency. I think I got $50 a week, then $150 a week. And at that time I was sharing a single bed with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And sort of through my 20s, spent a bit of time around the underground hip hop world. Melbourne has a great scene. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the, the characters, a lot of the heroes down there, but I was making my own rap magazine, it was called Stealth, first full color hip hop magazine in the Southern Hemisphere with a CD-ROM attached. And Australia's got a great uh, and a beautiful history as far as hip hop and appreciation of the, the culture and the, the art form. Uh, and I was doing the main hip hop radio show for about five years. I was writing for Street Press, like 3D World and Impress, tens and tens of magazines, often for free or, or for cheap, to be honest. And then kind of on the side, I was also working day jobs, sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time in agencies. So Tribal DDB, I worked at a dot-com when I was 2021 called K Grind. It raised, I don't know what it was, $12 million, which was a ton of money back in 1999. And it, it died as soon as the stock market crashed. And also meandered through places like Leo Burnett, where I worked for Todd Sampson, who gave me my first account planning or strategy role when I was 28. And it was a bit of an experiment. I was a hybrid so to speak, which was 50% of my time was spent doing digital work because that's what I grew up doing. So information architecture, wireframes for companies like Rabobank, like their website I, I did the information architecture for back then. Uh, Kotex, you buy Kotex, Kleenex, all kinds of brands. Uh, and then on the, on the other in the other part of my day job, I was also doing brand planning for brands like, like Canon and spent a bit of time at McCann and then hit my early thirties with a couple of young kids, was a bit burnt out, wondering what's life all about and decided to try to move somewhere a little bit bigger and came to New York. And I've been here for 10 years now, first five years working for other companies and, and, and other agencies. And, and honestly, a lot of culture shock. I struggled. I really struggled to do the work that I wanted to do. I was warned about that before I came uh, way more conservative than Australia uh, and even conservative people in Australia who have that Aussie banter, can't do it here can't do it in all the situations that you think you can so even if you're like a small c conservative person there's a bit of a culture shock if you do business in in the u.s in large corporate america uh, and for the past five years yeah doing my own my own work through mighty jungle and through sweathead which is a combination of consulting training 
conferences, writing, just, just trying to build a life around the things that bring me to life. And then increasingly now, it's just starting to bring people into work in this quote unquote company. And it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So thank you for, for the context. And it is interesting because um, to hear, you know, you've come from, come from you know, perhaps the, the agency landscape. Some of our viewers have probably been um, perhaps looked at strategy more from a, from a business strategy perspective. I believe that I've learned, or I personally have learned a lot from the perspectives that you have brought and are still bringing through your podcasts around looking at strategy, I'd say, you know, at a, in a bit of a deeper way. And and looking at and looking at some of the stuff you're putting out there, um, your podcast, your book, etc. Uh, it it has, it has as as, mentioned, as I mentioned, has given me the courage and and it, looking at, at a lot of your community, given them the courage to dig a bit deeper of really what is what is this thing strategy, and what is it at a human level. So can I can ask you: Is there anything that perhaps has inspired you, and and perhaps how you've had the had the courage? to dig a bit deeper in both your personal life and your, and your career? Yeah, look, it, it comes from crisis and pain. It comes from growing up in a way where I didn't always know how to fit my brain and my interests and my emotions into the world. Um, it comes from trying to change companies while not knowing if I was an employee. It comes from trying to feed a family in New York, privileged positions, obviously, but there's still always on a temp, especially on a temporary visa, like, oh my gosh, what if this all blows up and we have to go back during the pandemic? What if it all blows up? We have to go back, but we can't leave the country or get into a country. So there are these, these sort of pains that are, that are in me, uh, having grown up in a you know, family that split when I was pretty young. And not to kind of glorify that, romanticize it or make it too big a part of the story. I've just read research that that kind of stuff does sit in you in a way that you have to process. And so the strategy life for me was really about taking something that was initially intimidating, like, oh my gosh, strategy or account planning. How do I do that? Everyone seems so smart and so official and so formal. And over time, you work on things that are relatively successful and you are in the meetings or you have a little shoulder to shoulder bump in a corridor and that leads to really effective work and you're like oh okay a lot of this is made up but if it's made up what are the tools that we're using to make it up ideas and words typically and intuition with a little bit of data but my bias is towards the other three at the very least and so yeah the, the book is really just trying to process uh, all of that including you know entering my 40s and trying to work out what life's about so that's, that's seriously where it's at where it comes from. Uh, that's that's very refreshing, Mark. Because I know, well, for myself, I probably struggled myself in in really opening up and saying, you know, where does my kind of career or business life fit within my personal, you know, um, background and situation? And I think a lot of myself and a lot of other people perhaps are still afraid, perhaps, to merge those two together for whatever reason. Um, there's probably good and bad intents behind that. But I think the more we can do that, you know, in the in this topic of strategy, the deeper and the 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 more richness we get out of it. And I know that's that's what you're helping to inspire. In terms of in terms of looking at strategy in the broader context, as I understand it, you know, your within your book and a lot of your your current work you're doing, it's in the context of brand uh, and marketing and agency. We, we also see strategy probably probably from more that traditional and that conventional mindset of overall business strategy. So, you know, suits in, in boardrooms, perhaps, you know, older boards that are, that are struggling to connect with, with the community and what's really happening. I, I'd really be interested to hear your opinion in terms of do you see there's differences in strategy between those different areas, as well as perhaps, you know, that big four consulting mindset. Do you see those those perhaps merging at where we are at the moment and into the future? Yeah, potentially. But I, I also need to be slightly honest and, and point out that the trade or craft that I, I was fortunate enough to kind of come up in, and it wasn't until I was 28, working with Todd Sampson, who most Australians would know because he's on the Gruen Transfer and has about 50 TV shows. It, it wasn't until then that I sort of wrapped my head around it. And, and that role was called account planning. The US is more familiar with the word strategy. The 
the term account planning came out of the UK where account planning and advertising was invented just over 50 years ago. And I would like to call that out because a lot of people have an issue who gets to do strategy and say the word strategy. And it's usually people who think strategy is silent word in front of it, business strategy, but it's not. Strategy is critical thinking about how to solve problems through insight and data connected to determine ways to solve those problems, decisions that can help you solve those problems that also then let you allocate resources, which is, you know, I have shorter ways of summarizing what I think these things are. And so totally understand and respect someone who's very good at quote unquote business strategy saying that what they do is different to what someone in advertising does. But I deliberately use some broad words that I try to come in, in into in a new way in a fresh way and I define them and I want them to be more applicable than just to advertising because the way that I try to see the world it can affect quote unquote business strategy but also you can apply some of our strategy techniques to your own mental health to your own negative self-talk you know what's the problem that I'm facing how am I criticizing myself right now how can I solve that criticism and from what I understand, that's called mentalization. I know it's a really big word and Aussies would go, that sounds like a horribly American word, but I've heard psychologists and psychiatrists talk about that, that, you know, part of therapy and part of understanding what we're about is this mentalization process. And then you start to realize not that different to writing, not that different to philosophy, not that different to critical thinking. So at some point, all of these things nest really, really closely. And if that's true, if you believe that, then why do so many people try to push them apart? And it's usually because of desire for power, authority, and wealth, you know? And so we create these unnecessary nuances and trademark frameworks and language, which I don't do. I have frameworks that I like to use, but they're not like, you know, it's not like the Boston matrix or anything like that. And and then, and also finally, finally, there's a great book that I'm sure you've read or your, your people have come across called The Lords of Strategy. And it's journalists charting the history of management accounting and management consulting, well, really more management consultancies. And you realize that in the early days, a lot of the leaders in that space, they came up with a few diagrams and sold the crap out of them for 10 years. And then they did it again. And like, oh, hang on. So they made it up too. But you can't, I doubt those kinds of conversations and that level of honesty would happen within the business world. Not that different, just different clothing, shop at different places, get their haircuts at different places. Yeah, I, th I think that's brilliant. And, and as you were talking there, I could very much relate to, so critical thinking and how strategy really relates to mental health, our own self-talk and mentalization, as you mentioned. That's, I gotta say, that's probably what I experienced when I was reading the book. And when I've listened to, you know, podcasts from a walk and talk in Central Park to some of the others, I, I really do think that's what was what was helping me to be become aware of my self-talk and, you know, broader mentalization, as, as you put it. And I think that the more that the more to that level that we can all, whether whether it's that consultancy, that business strategy or whatever it would be to get to that level. Uh, I think I think as you say, it's you know we we're better it, we're better as human beings, not a lot, not not just our career or, or the professional things we're doing. So uh, I think that's that's really touched on a chord for me of, of what I was experiencing, you know, when I was reading the book. Thank you, thank you. And can I just make one point about that? Like I I was dipping my toe in bringing those things together for a good three or four years, really since my late thirties, and then especially when I turned forty. I kind of came up in this beautiful Australian blogger sphere of strategy and social media people, I don't know, 15 years or so ago. And we would write really personal things about our lives. And it was not common back then. And it was definitely not common by people who were in our industry. Our industry was advertising, competitive, you know, a little bit cutthroat and alpha. And you didn't want to reveal things about yourself. And there's a little crew of us that started to do it. But I kept the stories relatively apart from quote unquote strategy. And it was from doing events around the world, uh, often with a gentleman, a good friend who's now back in Melbourne called Julian Cole, who also does a lot of teaching around strategy. 
where at the end of these full day sessions, we'd have 40 people in a room and I started to do this 15 to 20 minute session that I would always rush and I'd always be nervous that I was, there's a new phrase for you, trauma bombing people. Like here's all the stuff that I feel and all the stuff that I grew up with, uh, which a lot of people deny. And it was called strategy upon a strategist. And every single time I felt vulnerable, exhausted, I felt like I might have traumatized and triggered people. And yet afterwards, I caught up with everyone. They'd be like, oh, totally. I totally relate to that. Me, brother, niece, cousin, father, mother, grandmother has gone through all of that sort of stuff. And just hearing you talk about it, and I'm not saying this in a self-congratulatory way, it was you know, just, it was just this series of beautiful moments where people would say me hearing you talk about it. I feel like I can now talk about it more. And all of a sudden the group on that very night are sharing really personal and candid stories. And so I tiptoed into it. And then over time, I'm like, they're not different things, critical thinking. If your main client in life is you, why don't you think about the strategy on yourself? You know, and sure, I'll spend pages of a book, minutes of an interview podcast or hours of a training event talking about strategy for brands, but I'm going to come at it in a weird way. I'm going to come at it through the things that are already in your head. Now, we're just finishing off a six or seven week strategy program with 40 people from a big holding agency right now. And it's really similar feedback that comes up. First of all, I know that a lot of people won't get what I do. The super concrete, logic-oriented people who struggle with intuition and introspection, they'll be like, that guy's a clown, too many words. He's just like, blah, 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 blah. I get it. But then there's a whole other group of people who will say, finally, you shone a light on the things that are already in my head. You know, for example, the little quips that we make to each other or make to ourselves, really, that it could be insights or the little quips in our heads that could be really provocative and interesting problem statements. And my trick is I go and go that thing there that you're thinking right now, stop rewriting it into the corporate speak, let it be. And I feel it's, it's really quite a powerful moment for people to see that and then to trust in themselves and people around them as they then go about trying to change the way that they work. I think the that, a couple of terms that was a long speech no i loved it mark thank you for sharing it you know if you if your main um, client in life is you and shining a light on things that perhaps are already in our own heads i think that's what what was happening to me and and listening to some of your other other community that is exactly what's happening to them and i would have to say that you know the comment there in terms of perhaps there are people that won't resonate from what I see within your community and, and broader, I do see a bit of a shift perhaps people, and perhaps the pandemic has been part of it, that they've got to a point and they're thinking, if we continue to do things and just look at things in that concrete way, I don't think we're gonna move forward. So I believe that um, you know, bringing that perspective, I think he's actually having a larger effect on that conventional business community than you think you might be having, because it has had on me, and on some of our community already. So, so I, I continue to inspire you to continue to go broad. And I, I think you might be you know, more surprised than, than, you, than you think perhaps. I hear you, it's there. It's there for people who understand difficulties in life and who are capable of empathy. Uh, unfortunately, businesses don't optimize for those kinds of people because the people that most businesses optimize for, which is not a criticism, is people who are good at operating systems in a very detached way. And that's why we see statistics probably about, you know, sociopathy, psych psychopathy. I have like five different accents these days and, and maybe like high, high performing Asperger's, right? And, and autism in, in engineering and, and all these kinds of things, you know, task oriented, systems oriented, oriented versus people, people oriented. So I would understand why people wouldn't, wouldn't get it. It's just really relieving when you receive, you know, like a 500 word email where someone's like, I read your thing or I listened to an interview and I've just made really big life decisions because of it. Decisions I thought I want to make and then now I am. And, and so, yeah, there, there's something about this, which is it's hard for people to understand unless you've faced crisis and you don't want to go back to 10, 20 years of just, you know, moving things around a desk 
different options around a desk where you actually want to make a life change and where you don't think there's any, there's no way back. And so you're like, well, what could my life's work be? Because all these different experiences, all this emotion, which I've felt since I was a kid and a brain that doesn't stop and with a love of words, where does it go? And so understanding the various emotions of what I'm saying right now, because you could listen to that if you're like a serious business person, be like, oh, that sounds too emotional or too negative. Does it? Because I'm building a business around it and doing really interesting things for me and trying to support a lot of other people from what other people might think is like a negative angle or a negative emotion. So I just, yeah, the part, part of this is while I give you my fifth speech of, of the discussion, just these things don't have to be separate. And the question is, what if your critical thinking in life and in business, in love, what if it's more powerful if you do see it together? Yeah, that's, that's hugely powerful. Thank you, Mark. Now, if we turn to, if we turn to um, I'm going to keep it simple in terms of the book. There was a few, you know, snippets and quotes I've taken out of there. And if, you, if you're okay with, I might just go through a few of them. And then just to get your, your kind of, get you talking a bit more in terms of what's happening behind the words, uh, which you've already touched mm -hmm. on today, or today in the conversation. So I appreciate that. It's, I got to I I got to tell you, when I saw you post on LinkedIn, the list of words, I was like, did I write all of those? That's weird. Oh my God. Oh my gosh. But I also, they're really, they're really important to me. And I, I wanted to write this book, not as a business book and not as a business card. You know, a lot of people write business books as business cards, throw them away for free at conferences. I was like, look, I want to, I want to try to make this art in a non-pretentious way, which means you can't get anything wrong. And it means that every page you got to sit down and try to take a risk. And, and then with art, you don't make one thing. You've got to make a whole life, a whole catalog of things. But uh, yeah, it was, it was really interesting to see the quotes that you took. And I'm curious to see what you choose now. I feel super self-indulgent, by the way, but I'm here for it. I like it. <laughs> no, it doesn't feel like that at all. I think it's inspiring because you've been, you've been, you know, you've had the courage to put it down and open up these worlds for us all. So if we start on, I'll put the topic in terms of what strategy or what could strategy really be? That's my 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 kind of heading, and the snippets that I've, I've taken from you from your book. Strategy is a search for truth. Strategy seeks to find truth. Truth can be scarring because because it shows us things we don't want to acknowledge. Now you've covered a bit of it, you know, in just in our conversation now. But can you give us a bit more context behind those words? Yeah, look, I don't think the search for truth through strategy is anything new, especially not in, in advertising. There are different kinds of truth and there's lots of people who might say there's no such thing as absolute truth in the way that we understand it, except for like hardcore, really, really proven science might be really true, but then it might also be relative. I don't know, it gets confusing, but, and, and I know a lot of people would freak at relativism and postmodernism talk right now, so I won't, I won't get into it. The heart of that sentence is the Honestly, the pain that someone who is empathetic and intuitive, who likes to understand people, who spent a lifetime trying to understand people, the pain that that person can feel when in a business environment, they're not allowed to be that honest. That's really what that sentence is about. You feel repressed. You're not sure what you can say. You might try to be honest. And then people are like, why are you being critical? And you're like, no, I'm just sharing things that I found or ways to solve that thing. To me, it's not being positive or negative or critical or complimentary. These are just things. The point is to work out what to do with the things that we found in our research, to form a strategy, to take action, to then optimize it all. So yeah, the heart of that sentence is about the, well, I guess the, that sort of spiritual tumultuous vibe and that can lead to like identity, identity crisis where a lot of people are like, hang on, I love doing this work. I think I love doing this work, but nobody seems to want me to do it the way that I think it needs to be done. So that's what that's about. Thank you. And I think that, you know, the, as you put it, you know, the pain and everyone can relate to that and perhaps not wanting to, you know, reveal what they're, what they're really feeling and thinking. I do see in business though, that the, the organizations that are really leaning into that in a genuine way, and actually trying to put themselves in what their, their broader community are actually feeling and going through. Uh, I, I, we do see glimpses of that. So 
um, yeah, I encourage you to keep keep going on that on that kind of line of thought to the to the broader community. In terms of empathy, um, these are the couple of the, couple of the lines. The call to empathy is a call to see the world not through your own eyes. Empathy imports truths from other people's realities. Yeah, that's a weird one. Gosh, what does that mean? No, look, empathy is about trying to quote unquote put yourself in somebody else's shoes, which you could argue is quite an arrogant thing to think that you can do. Can you really do that? But in strategy, at the very least, it's a matter of, and especially account planning and advertising, you know, part, a big part of the role, arguably the main part of the role is to try to understand people and to make sure that the advertising you're coming up with can potentially affect them, influence them, you know, and that doesn't have to be sinister. It doesn't have to be manipulative. You know, there are, there are degrees around this. So that's why you're trying to put certain truths on show uh, in, in advertising. And so, yeah, empathy is about trying to import download bring into your mind how other people feel almost as a default way to react to anything any conversation what's the problem we need to solve well hang on i've spoken to 10 people here's what i heard risk shadow side of empathy is you don't protect your own boundaries and feelings because you're so used to being flexible around other people and feeling other people's feelings brilliant thank you I'm not going to. I'm not going to add anything more to that because I don't. It, it'll. It'll won't do it any any value if I tried to add to it. So thank you. Uh, you know, on the topic of, of insights, and again, you touched on a bit of it, but a couple of the lines. Insights are not numbers. They are why numbers exist. The problem is focusing so much on data and information that knowledge and wisdom don't get time to happen. Now I can now I can relate so, to this personally. So I've this is probably this one is probably near and dear to me because although data is hugely important and it's 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 a growing thing, this really resonated with me in particular. Yeah. So what what that's trying to do is situate the word data within, or somehow connected to the DIKW pyramid: data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. I don't mind how people define their words, but if you're struggling on a project or with a team because of the words, work out what you're all saying, define the words. So for me on a project that's advertising based, I'd only use the word insight once. It's the insight. I would want to see it. If you're making a television ad or commercial, I would want to see the insight in the ad because it's going to make the ad more effective based on research that's out there. And going back to joining our lives, I always direct people to watch stand-up comedy and write down what you think the insight is. For me, an insight is somewhat of a revelation, a confession. I have more strict language that I would use when I'm working on a project. It can be a sentence that just, it just smacks you in the gut and you're like, oh, that's so true. That's so true. And it changes the way, potentially changes the way that you live because it helps you understand yourself differently. It helps you understand the world differently. So that's the first chunk that we need to talk about. Then we talk about the word data. The way I understand the word data, most people don't use it very well, don't use it correctly. And you can call it data, data, data. I never, I just say all three at once, by the way. I'm of the belief that data is meaningless until it means something. And at that point it's information. So the word blue piece of data, the number one, digit one, whatever piece of data, a photo of a book you could say is a piece of data. Like they, they don't mean anything until they're ascribed meaning. And at that point they move up in the DIKW pyramid and they, they or it becomes information. But why does this matter? Because over the past 10 years, we've had a massive campaign about big data by big data companies programmatic advertising, lots of cookies, cookies getting more expensive, people wanting to know that ideas that have never appeared in public are bulletproof, wanting to know that the insights are bulletproof and data driven. But if data is nothing until it is something, then what are you even talking about? And that can lead to, again, abuse within companies. 
where someone who's never done research, someone who doesn't know what data is and someone who doesn't know what an insight is, I've seen it so many times, will almost bully a team and say, yeah, but is that data driven? You've got a big pitch tomorrow. Is that data driven? What do you mean? And so one of the jokes that I'll use quite often is if somebody ever asks you if that insight uh, is data driven, let me do that again. Here's a joke. Here's a joke. I've got a strategy jokes. So I just haven't delivered them to other people in a long time because, you know, other people in pandemic and stuff. But, you know, if what's the correct answer to this question? Is that insight data driven or did you just make it up? The correct answer is yes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I know, I know it's a little bit of a Zen riddle. But that makes, that makes writing fun, you know, just to make riddles of things and to confuse people, to dislodge things that they're taking for granted, that they're doing robotically and that sometimes they're being abused for and by. I think, yeah, I think the, um, in terms of, I think you've encapsulated that, that beautifully, Mark, in terms of, you know, perhaps the, the broader campaign around data and big data and how, you know, you use the term, you know, bulletproof, and I relate that to some people try to bulletproof their own opinions, don't they? And that says, you know, I'm not going to listen to something else because here's the data, here's the data. So I think I can relate to that. I'm sure a lot of our listeners can, that, you know, if you get a bit of data that's so-called supports this, there's no room to even have a conversation about it. So I think that really highlights the need for, although it's hugely important, as you acknowledge, to, to perhaps go a bit deeper and, and, and that not only be the thing to focus on. I also liked your practical uh, example of, the, of, of you know, listening and going to stand up comedy and, and what is the real confession or insight there? And what is the thing that kind of, um, you know, it punches you in the gut in terms of that's what stands out. So I think that's a nice practical way to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. the, next, uh, the next kind of, uh, a part that I was looking at and I put it under ego and maybe that's that's something for me because maybe I'm struggling with my own ego at the moment who knows um, but the line under that um, from the book was there is indeed no shame in opinions the shame is when the opinion thinks it is a right answer and not the start to more questions yeah well, I feel like doing strategy work and specifically around advertising, it's the same with business though. I mean, even if you work in Japan where they're renowned for doing what, 20 to 30 year business plans, aren't they? You're just making it up. You're making an informed decision and with that informed decision in place internally, you're then going to make an argument for it, but you're still making it up. And I think that there can be a bit of an issue with people pretending that that's not what's going on. I see. Yep. Love it. Uh, and just a couple more to, to finish up on. A um, couple of lines here, and I'll put this under awareness. Uh, and the lines from the book, your own silence and the observations it invites is a beautiful book if you choose to read it. Distance from the thinking will help you see. And I, I think, you know, from what you've talked about already, that a lot of people in perhaps the business world that. Uh, perhaps are, are, are afraid of sitting in that silence because we're, we're all afraid of what we might, we might find. Or, you know, there's the ego approach. They feel like they have to be the smartest person and, and here's, here's the direction and, then, and this is where we're going without question. What, what do you see yeah. in, that, in that area? Yes, yeah, just training yourself to pay attention to your, your inner monologue, which, yeah, again, I guess the dark side of that is maybe you can't turn it off and you pay too much attention to it. But if you can every now and then get a bit of a distance from it, allow it to run. That's how the brain becomes creative. You turn off the prefrontal cortex, the exec executive functioning, you turn it down a little bit through well various means. Uh, and it allows the brain to chatter to itself and form new connections. And there's research about this, uh, that those new connections are obviously lateral thoughts happening and lateral thoughts or ideas, which is the act of creativity. Uh, and so, you know, like today, for example, I had a few interactions through the internet and through meetings where sometimes I'll just talk through things that I'm thinking or things that I've observed. And I have a few people ask me about whether what I observed was negative, like where's the positive stuff in that? And I, that's not even a frame of reference that I find useful. Like, why are you policing me 
for being negative or positive or positive. I'm just thinking aloud and I'm sharing it with you. And now you're making me feel that you're going to judge me. So I might not share things with you. What's going on? And it just led to a little quip, which is like, if you're policing people for negativity, then you're being negative about their negativity. Now that's just a bit of wordplay. And I'm not saying it's amazing. And I'm not, I don't even know if it's original, but it made me laugh. And so I put it on the internet, but that comes from paying attention to your day and then letting your brain wander. And then importantly, at some point capturing it. And for me, I capture it in, in words, which could be through a tweet or on Instagram every now and then in a journal. And, you know, I do think a lot of really prolific business people journal. I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty common where they're you know, writing journals or diaries or whatever the language is. I know it's probably different in Australia these days. Diaries here are different in the US, uh, calendar more than diary. Uh, but I know a lot of business people do that. You know, you might have a book where you write down your observations from a meeting. It's the same thing, but are you capturing the real honest stuff? Not necessarily like honest and mean, but just honest observations, honest reflections. And then you build up this body of work that you can draw upon. And a lot of these things that you write, because there is, from what I understand, a really powerful connection between the hand, pen, and brain. You're building up this store that you can draw upon, a store of raw material that you draw upon in, in months to come as you focus on something completely different that's when your brain's going to go to work. So, so that's really what that's about. It's a, uh, I think it's a, it's a good practical example of, of journaling and building up a body of work, as you put it, and raw material. I think it's a good reminder that we can all do that on a, on a daily basis. So the one I want to finish on, on Mark, in terms of relates to the, the four points approach that, that you've brought within the book and brought up, and you know, looking for the human problem behind the business problem, uh, reach beyond shallow symptoms to something that resembles a root cause. And I think for me, this one really resonates as well because you know, we're often so focused on the business problem. What is the business problem? And then how do we probably jumping too quickly to solve it? But you're taking it a step for, further. What is, what is the, the human problem behind that? And what is, what is the real deepest symptoms in terms of the root cause? Perhaps can you give us give us a, an example around that, perhaps where you've seen that work quite well? Yeah, and, and I realise that human problem behind business problem is it's, uh, a little jargony and hard to really wrap your head around. But what, what we're trying to solve for here, is, especially in advertising, but it's not just that. And I don't like it when I give an advertising example and people are like, oh, okay, well, that's just advertising. It's not. I'm just giving an advertising example. Let's say your brand lacks awareness and you, have, you work with an agency, an advertising agency, and your brief to them is like, here's our problem. Our brand lacks awareness. I don't know what to do with that because advertising will probably increase your awareness, but I don't know how to solve that. And so what we're looking for, what I like to look for is the problem in the, from the mind of the customer, consumer, user, person who buys your thing, right? So let's say... I think the game of cricket has changed since I've been away from Australia in the past 10 years, right? But I'd imagine at some point, the business people who run cricket or Cricket Australia sat down and they were like, oh, our sales aren't as good. Don't, don't give an advertising agency that brief because they're, all they're going to say is like, why? And it could be, well, like families don't have eight hours or whatever it is to spend in, a stand, in, in the stands anymore. Or it could be a strange but powerful problem if you can prove that it's a big enough problem that like, People don't like sitting down anymore. I don't know what it is, but that's a way more interesting starting point for a business to solve from an experience and product point of view. And maybe even business model, shift its business model. Maybe it's standing, standing cricket, but you stand based on the, I don't know, the space you want to take up. I don't know. I'm making stuff up on the fly, but it's really important from an advertising point of view because advertising is trying to convince people to do something that they're not currently doing. So you want to understand why they're not currently doing it. And there are different schools of how to grow a brand and different schools of advertising, but approaching problems from the mindset of the people who are not doing what you want them to do is useful for your tool set. Brilliant. I think, uh, I think we can all kind of lean into that. Um, you know, the way of looking at things. So uh, thank you for sharing that. 
Mark, it's um again, thank you very much for, for spending some time and again, really putting your heart and soul into the book and, and broader, the broader communities you're building. We do see it's having starting to have a real impact on the broader business community in terms of strategy. So I really think that that's 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 growing leagues and it's gonna it's it's having a big influence. So um, I inspire you to keep keep putting you know the, the real stuff you're putting out there. And also it, it really, I think it touches on people's broader than that, the mental health, their self-talk and the mentalization, as you put it. Um, it's really had a had a huge impact on myself personally and some of our community. So I want to just inspire you to, to keep keep going with the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, two two things by way of finishing. When I was writing this book, I, I was wondering, like, could I write a book that felt like it was reading you other than you were reading it? And that's something that sometimes when I do interviews or do, do teaching, I try to get into people's heads because the most powerful epiphanies, they, they're self-generated. As a writer or a speaker or a teacher or whatever you are, an artist, you're just providing a little glint, a little glean. The work happens because the person wants it to happen and they work on themselves to make it happen. And so to, to hear you and, and other people talk about how the book has affected you in, in this kind of way is amazing. And also super interesting, just like publishing this sort of stuff because you posted about it on LinkedIn and I'm pretty sure 10 people bought the book from, I had a really quick look at the comments and I had a quick look at the sales coming through. And so from one post, I think you might've sold about 10 books, which is amazing. So thank, thank you for that. Uh, but also that just shows like that the power of like real authentic as a word I usually avoid, but like real relationships and real voices and voices that can be honest where honesty acknowledges all the beauty and all the pain of the world. Maybe not all the time, cause that's exhausting, but it's not afraid to venture into it a little bit. So whatever you're doing, you're obviously building a, a canon and a voice and relationships that are probably going to travel with you to new places as well so may you continue to do that because the world needs more of it thank you mark and and your comment it was reading you i think nearly everyone that reads the book would would have that experience and feeling and it's pretty unique in a book so uh yeah that's i think you've for me you've, you've nailed that so Thank you again. All the very best for the rest of the year and, and looking forward to, to, to hearing um, all, all, the, all the good stuff you're continuing to put out. Thank you. Thank you for having me. May you stay prolific. Cool.